Welcome to the University of Nebraska's discussion on proposed retirement plan enhancements. My name is Bruce Kern from Human Resources, and we're so glad you're able to join us either in person today or by viewing this uh, recorded presentation on the nebraska.edu website. Any questions or comments can be directed to benefits at nebraska.edu. If you'd like to ask a question at the end of this presentation, please do so in the Q&A section of your Zoom screen. The focus of these enhancements are to create savings for NU employees. Modernizing our retirement plan will create a streamlined lineup of investment options while at the same time increasing options for those employees who wish to use additional investment products. Our goal is to have the best retirement plan possible for NU employees. What is staying the same? First, it's important to say that your contribution and the university's contribution will be staying the same. There's no change. You will continue to be 100% vested, which means when you have access to your money and the university's money, no change there. TIA and Fidelity will remain as our two main retirement vendors. So no change there. Slide, please. What is changing is how you pay TIA and or Fidelity to keep track of your investments. These fees will be more transparent and a fixed amount. Our core investment options will be streamlined with low cost and diversified options. A service called a brokerage window, which we will talk about later on in this presentation, will allow thousands of investment options if an employee wants more choice. And the effective date of these changes is targeted uh, for November 1st, 2022. Next slide, please. University of Nebraska is enhancing our retirement program after a thoughtful review by a university-wide committee and outside consultant reviewed our retirement plan. Current projected savings are approximately $11 million per year to all of our employees, retirees, and separated uh, employees. This means that over $400 per year is gonna be saved by each participant. The university sees no savings from these changes. 100% of the savings are going to employees. Through the consultant, the committee was able to secure lower fees for record keeping and low cost investment options. Next slide, please. These were the members on the university-wide committee. Slide, please. As noted earlier, 100% of these savings will be received by employees. The university receives nothing. Over a 10-year period, savings to employees will exceed $110 million. Slide, please. Also, it's important to note that we're not alone in these enhancements. Several other universities have done the same things that we are doing right now, and we sought their counsel, and they were very helpful as we prepared these enhancements. Now, Brian Schlicking, Assistant Vice Chancellor and Director of Benefits, will talk more about the details of our enhancements. Brian? Next slide, please. Uh, thank you very much, Bruce. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm gonna spend just a few moments talking about our record keeping fee structure that will start on November 1st. From the onset, I'd like to make it, make it clear that this is not a new fee, but likely one you were not aware of in the past. I'll talk about that a little bit more coming up. Under our new plan design, we'll be transitioning to a simple and transparent fixed dollar per head record keeping fee. Regardless of how many accounts you have, you'll be charged the same record keeping fee with Fidelity and TIA. So if you have a 401A plan, a 403B plan, or a 457B plan, you'll be charged that same fee with each vendor. At Fidelity, that fee will be $29 per year. At TIA, that record keeping fee will be $38 per year. If you have investment balances, with both TIA and Fidelity, you'll have to pay record keeping fees at each vendor. So your total record keeping fees for your retirement plan investments will be $67 per year. Slide please. So consequently, if you don't wanna pay record keeping fees at both TIA and Fidelity, you may wanna transfer your investments to one vendor. 
The next speaker is going to talk a little bit about the upcoming changes to the investment investment menu, but I'll preview it a little bit here and say that it's going to be mostly a harmonized menu at both TIA and Fidelity. So it might make sense for you to consolidate your investments into one vendor. To accomplish that consolidation, you'll contact the vendor you want to transfer your assets to, and they'll get you started on the process. So if you want to transfer your assets to Fidelity, you call Fidelity at that number on the slide. That number is also on our benefits website. And, or if you want to transfer your assets to TIA, you'll contact TIA at that number on the slide there. And they'll, they'll help you with the process. The next step in the process is you'll have to change your current and going forward contributions so they're sent to one vendor. To change those current contributions, you'll need to contact your campus benefit office and they'll assist you in that process. So to review, it's a two-step process. You change your vendor with your current investment by contacting either TIA or Fidelity to assist you in that process. And the second step is you change your current contribution allocations by contacting your campus benefit office. Next slide, please. Like I mentioned in my opening, this is not a new fee for our retirement plan, but one you were likely not aware of in the past. The existing plan design collected fees exclusively through what was called expense ratios that in included fees for both investment management and record keeping. The fees you paid varied based on your investment elections and your balances. So the new plan will charge you a modest fixed dollar per head record keeping fee and it's paired with low investment fees. The table at the bottom of this slide demonstrates that the, save, the savings of the new fee structure. No matter what your status and balance, we anticipate savings from this new structure. Slide, please. My final slide takes a step back and explains why the record keeping fees exist in the retirement plan. In general, record keeping fees pay for the services of Fidelity and TIA to administer our retirement plans. They pay for items such as the on-campus retirement representatives from TIA and Fidelity that you meet with to discuss your retirement plan goals and your investment strategies. They also pay for a lot of the core administrative services that are necessary to administer our retirement plan by Fidelity and TIA. It pays for the enrollments, the enrollment process, the distribution process, buying, selling, and holding your retirement and plus your investments, and also the website participant portals that TIA and Fidelity make available for you that you go out and check your investment, uh, your investment status with Fidelity and TIA on. It pays for the phone support. It pays for adv investment advice and education that's provided by TIA and Fidelity. And finally, it pays for statements and tax documents that are produced by Fidelity and TIA. So now I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Dr. Brian Baugh, who's a member of our committee and an assistant professor of finance at UNL. Brian's gonna walk us through the investment menu. So Brian, the floor is yours. Sorry, uh, next slide, please. Thank you, Ryan, for the introduction. And it is my pleasure to introduce the new menu uh, to our plan participants. So as Brian I told us, the menu will be mostly harmonized across Fidelity and Kia. And the foundation of our new menu is going to be comprised of Vanguard mutual funds. The most important of which is the first, which are the suite of Vanguard target retirement date funds. These are designed to be a one-stop shop investment uh, choice for you that adjusts your risk profile as you age. So they are literally designed to be the only investment you would ever need to own in your life. And we'll talk more about that next slide. But if you don't like the hands-off approach of a target date fund, we are offering a suite of mutual funds that are broad-based and extremely low cost. The first of which is the total US stock market fund, which literally owns every US stock in the economy. 
Similarly, the total international stock attempts to do the same, but for international uh, stocks, uh, such as developed and emerging markets into a single fund. Next, the total US bond market fund owns the entirety of the, the bonds available in the US. Uh, so it's gonna be a mix of corporate as well as government bonds. Next, we're gonna offer a money market fund as is common throughout pretty much any retirement plan I can think of. But what is new to our plan going forward is what many other institutions are doing as well, which is to offer employees who want expanded choices, a, what's called a brokerage account or a brokerage window, where they can access thousands of mutual funds uh, off menu. Now, just to be clear, this brokerage account or brokerage window within your retirement account, it is not the same as a brokerage account that you get on your own. Uh, so the first distinction is that the, any of the tax benefits you would receive through a conventional 401a will also be present in this brokerage window embedded in your retirement accounts. So the deferral of capital gains and the, the tax benefits with dividends, right, that, that will all be unchanged uh, from before. Uh, individual securities like Tesla or Google within your brokerage account within your retirement account. Of course, that is different than if you were to open a brokerage account on your own, where you would have full access to any security that you'd want. So that's another key distinction. And you might be thinking, well, that sounds great. It must be expensive. And it turns out that let's, let's take the case with Fidelity. So if you choose Fidelity as your record keeper going forward, they offer a quite generous uh, brokerage window and to give you an idea, so they're gonna offer on the order of 8,000 uh, mutual funds through their platform. Um, a lot of these on the order of a few thousand are gonna be available without any transaction costs. So you're not gonna pay to transact, but you'd be responsible for the underlying expense ratios or, or fees of, of the fund itself, um, just like you would in a, in a brokerage account on your own. Um, but, but one neat thing to, to consider is with Fidelity, if you choose them as your vendor going forward, you would have access to the suite of Fidelity mutual funds uh, at no transaction fee. So as an example, if for some reason you prefer an S&P index to the total US stock market index, even though they're, they're practically identical, would that work? You could, you could invest in an S&P index in your Fidelity brokerage window, and you would incur a fee of 1.5 basis points or 0.15, which is exactly the same fee as you're paying today for that particular fund in, in our. And uh, what I want you to understand is it, it opens up the universe of mutual funds, including any mutual fund you're currently invested in. If again, if you're an advanced investor who wants that added complexity. And then another key difference, uh, point of differentiation between TIA and Fidelity going forward is that at only at TIA is where you'll be able to access that TIA traditional annuity that is very popular among our plan partners. Slide, please. Again, the Probably the most important uh, investment that we're offering going forward are these Vanguard target date funds. And as I said before, they're intended to be a one-stop shop, your only investment essentially for the rest of your life. As you're young, they allocate a good chunk of your portfolio, specifically 90% of your portfolio uh, to stocks across US and international stocks. As you age, uh, the risk profile dials down and you can see the allocations uh, across every age. So again, the only thing you need to decide as a target date fund investor is to choose the date in which you plan on retiring. I'm 40 years old now, if I wanna retire in 25 years, perhaps I choose a 2065 Vanguard target retirement fund. I, and I, I remain invested in that until I die. Um, so it's, it's as simple as that, and that's the one decision you would make, and it's, it's all hands off. Uh, next slide. Might rationally be asking yourself, well, you know, I've been taught since, since I was real young that it's important to diversify and, you know, your investments. And indeed, this, this menu could 
appear to be a little bit contradictory on that dimension until you peek under the hood. So that those Vanguard target retirement funds, as we just showed you, uh, hold over 10,000 stocks across the US and international, as well as over 10,000 bonds across the US and abroad. Uh, meaning you're getting a whole lot of exposure through a single investment choice. The US stock market fund, you're, you're owning the entire US economy, at least all, all stocks that are publicly traded. So that's over 4,000 firms that you're getting exposure to with that single uh, in, index fund. Uh, next, uh, the total international stock market fund owns approximately 8,000 international stocks across developed and international, or sorry, developed and emerging markets. Total US bond market holds over 10,000 bonds across, again, across the uh, firms, uh, corporate bonds, as well as government bonds. Uh, so each of these few investment choices we're offering, they're very deliberate and well curated uh, for their broad diversification as well as low costs. Next slide. Speaking of low costs, uh, let's, let's get at it and, and see what kind of fees and, and costs we we're able to negotiate and leverage uh, through these economies of scale in, our, in, in the billions of plan assets. These target date funds, again, the backbone of our new plan going large, uh, we've negotiated a fee of 0.045%, otherwise known as four and a half basis points. Uh, that's gonna be the fee that, that you'll be charged in your 401A and 457. And you might not have a very good understanding for how big or small that fee is. Well, with your the equivalent fund in a TIA account currently, they're charging you 0.45% or 10 times the, what Vanguard is going to charge going forward. And if you're invested in one of these funds in a Fidelity account, they're currently charging 0.5% or 11 times what Vanguard is going to charge going forward. So what do I want you to understand? That these fees are at least a 90% reduction in fees relative to what we're currently paying in the, the other options. Uh, the fees for the total stock market index are 1.4 basis points international is 5.9 basis points and so on. So these fees are as close to zero as we could possibly achieve. Uh, now you'll notice an important kind of subtle distinction here is that within the 401A and 457, you'll notice that we can achieve slightly lower fees than in the 403B. The reason behind this is somewhat archaic and it's driven by difference in, in, in laws, um, but what do I need you to understand? At least, at least initially, we're gonna need to charge a, a very slightly higher fee uh, in our 403B for the, these particular investments and, um, and the fees are listed there. Uh, so we're gonna have to offer mutual funds uh, for each of these funds uh, in the 403B. Uh, CIT stands for Collective Investment Trusts. And when your plan is of a sufficiently large size, you can, you can really leverage these economies of scale into these trusts that behave much like a mutual fund, but they have lower overhead and hence lower expenses. And another question that might arise on the slide is why there's a range in mutual fund fees. You know, for example, take the total stock market index ranging from 0.2 to 0.3%. The truth is we as a committee don't know what fees our plan will incur yet because um, Vanguard will charge a fee. It's a function of how many assets flow to that particular fund. If we get over 100 million in assets for a given fund, like the total stock market index, we'll achieve the lower end of that, that fee spectrum or two basis points there. Uh, if we achieve less than 100, uh, then we'll have uh, you know, one basis until our plan grows a little bit more. So I guess moral of the story, what I want you to take away from the slide is that the fees that we've negotiated with these economies of scale with our billions in plan assets are incredible. They're on the order of 90% less than we've been paying historically. Um, and, and that is the source of the 11 million a year savings is this drastic reduction in fund fees for these variety of fund options. Next slide. You know, you, if, you, if you're not a finance professor, you, you might not be impressed by, you know, 0.45% per year in annual savings on investments until you, you look at the math 
and you model this. So, you know, in both of these charts, I'm assuming a 6% return. On the left chart, I'm, I'm assuming a $10,000 per year of annual contributions. On the right chart, we're, we're pretending we're retired and we're saying, well, what happens if we start with a million dollar portfolio, withdraw 70,000 per year? And, and just what is the difference in balances across these two fee structures? And again, I'm trying to make my best apples to apples comparison here. And um, I'm appropriately penalizing or including this $29 per year fixed fee in this analysis. And the left chart shows that um, with lower fees, this individual is allowed or enabled to save about 100,000 more. And again, if we start from scratch and we say, okay, now we're, we're both at a million dollars starting, um, the, the person on, on the right, right, on this chart on the right, the low fee individual uh, ends up after 30 years of retirement with about a quarter million dollars more in wealth. Uh, so again, low fees matter to someone who's, in, who's still working, someone who's retired, uh, fees matter. Uh, next slide. And you know you might astutely notice well why why did the why did the committee select index funds as opposed to actively managed funds? Well, as as we showed you previously, they offer an immense amount of diversification on the order of thousands of of stocks per fund, and due to their they offer higher average returns than actively managed funds. The chart on the bottom left shows an interesting statistic, which is over the past ten years. 82.5% of mutual funds have underperformed the simple S&P 500 index. For those unfamiliar, the S&P 500 index is simply the group of the 500 largest stocks in the economy. Okay. In other words, only 17.5% of mutual funds happen to beat that S&P over that time period. And over long longer horizons, say 15, 20 years, it's going to be an even smaller percentage of of individuals, or sorry, of mutual funds that are beating the, the market. And, and this fact has been echoed ad nauseum in the academic literature. It, it's probably the most robust fact I know of in all of finance is that fees matter. Here's a paper by Ken French. He's a Dartmouth professor. His, his longtime co-author is Chicago economist, uh, Gene, uh, a few years ago. And I just want to read the last sentence of this abstract. He says, under reasonable assumptions, the typical investor would increase his average annual, annual return by 67 basis points or 0.67% per year over the 1980 to 2006 period if he switched to a passive market portfolio. Again, the compounded effect of these fees is enormous. Next slide. It's not just academics who tout the benefits of passive management, but also practitioners, uh, the most famous of which is probably Warren Buffett. And over his investing career, he's been long been a fan of passive investing. And in his 2013 letter to shareholders, um, he, he gives advice to individuals and he tells them to invest passively in index funds. I'll read a couple of quotes here. Uh, the goal of the non-professional should not to be not, should not be to pick winners, neither he nor his helpers can do that, but should rather be to own a cross-section of businesses that an aggregator, aggregate are bound to do well, a low-cost S&P 500 index fund will achieve this goal. Um, I guess the second to last uh, paragraph, keep your costs minimal, invest in stocks as you would a farm. And then interestingly, right, in his will, he's telling his trustee uh, to do the following put 10% of the cash in short-term government bonds and 90% at a very low cost S&P 500 index fund, I suggest Vanguard's. I believe the trust long-term results from this policy will be superior to those attained by most investors with pension funds, institutions, or individuals who employ high fee managers. Again, those who understand the math understand the importance of fees and costs and, and the new plan, our new plan going forward is leveraging that fact. Uh, next slide. And see that that uh, Warren Buffett is a proponent of Vanguard. Uh, you know, you mentioned them by name, and it, I guess it's no surprise that when we look at the size of assets under management uh, by Vanguard, they start. Next fund was invented in 1975. It has grown to essentially 7.3 trillion in assets uh, under, under 2021. 
And Vanguard is, is world renowned for their best in class asset management, as well as lowest in class costs, as we saw previously. So I think that's what I had to say about the investment menu, and I'll pass it over to Jim from CapTrust, our consultant, uh, to then talk about this mapping process. Thank you, Brian. It's a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> Appreciate the opportunity to speak with uh, all of you on the phone. So as Brian mentioned, uh, myself and Joey Payne on the video, I've been working with this committee uh, for the better part of the last uh, 10, 12 months on this project, and we're excited to continue to talk through the changes. If we flip one slide, I'm going to talk, start with a few comments about how do we get from here to there, if you will. That is, how do we move into the new menu? There's a, a term called mapping, which relates to accumulations, existing assets you have in your plan, and also your future contributions. And so <clears throat> you have uh, beginning in November, November 1st, there will be a mapping exercise that will map all of your existing balances that are mappable, which I'll talk about that in a minute, into the new menu and future contributions will be mapped into the new menu in order to take advantage of the low cost that Brian has discussed and the opportunity to broadly diversify across just a, a, hand, a very small handful of funds. Uh, this is designed to make it easier for the vast majority of plan participants who would like some help with this plan. Um, there, are, uh, there will be a two month window prior to November 1 where if you wanted to build your own allocation using the future state menu or take advantage of the brokerage window, you can do that through the months of September and October. There are exceptions to mappability, as I noted a few minutes ago. There is a, a basket of assets in the Fidelity 403B plan that are uh, not mappable by virtue of investors' contracts with Fidelity. And there are accounts at TIA that are variable annuities, which I'll show you in a minute, that are not mappable as well. Accumulations in those accounts will not map. Uh, it will be up to participants to migrate those accumulations into the future state menu if you choose to do so. Next page, please. This talks about the time period in which you can opt out of the mapping. That is, you can rebuild your allocation the way you want it during the months of September and October. Um, of course, you can use investments in the new menu. And then as Brian mentioned, the, the thousands of uh, mutual funds that are available to you so that you can build a more precise asset allocation if you choose to do so. Next page, please. This is a little bit more color on uh, what is not mappable. So existing balances in TI and craft annuities, we've listed them here. These are unaffected. So these accumulations are not mappable. Uh, they are that by virtue of your investment contract, again, with TIAA. And there is a small basket of funds also at Fidelity that are not mappable for the same reasons. Future contributions, if they were earmarked for these funds, again, would be mapped into the new menu into the age appropriate target date fund. And a little word about that, uh, Brian, it said you can choose the, the year in which you plan to retire. If a choice is not made, you'll be mapped to the fund that most closely corresponds to the age in which you turn 65, the year in which you turn 65. Uh, this is not a one-time event during the months of September and October. You can move your accumulations before that event or after that event. Uh, so then that goes on forever. You can always, you have control over your balances in these non-mappable funds. Uh, you can uh, encourage you to take a look at the expenses and performance of these and to see if it is appropriate for you to move into the, the new core menu. Next page, please. Um, as I said, um, the, the, the list we showed on the previous page, uh, absent TI traditional, those TIA and craft annuities will not be part of the future state menu. TIA traditional, which is a very popular uh, fixed annuity account, will remain open in the future in the new menu. <clears throat> These accounts were left behind for a mix of either expense, performance, or sometimes both, which is why they're no longer going to be part of the future state menu. Those are the TIA and the craft accounts. Next page, please. There are some changes to the TIA traditional. Again, this is the flagship annuity, fixed annuity from TIA, and they have um, 
modernized their TI traditional. And there's some important distinctions here today. The accumulations you have in your TI traditional today have a nine year withdrawal period so that your balance is subject to uh, nine years and one day distributions out. You have for that, what I would might call a liquidity constraint, you have a minimum guaranteed crediting rate of 3%. And that's a, a common number that TIs talk to faculty and staff about for many years, the 3% minimum guarantee. The current crediting rate is 3.25. We're migrating to a more contemporary, newer version of TI traditional that is a little bit more permissible with uh, liquidity. That is a seven-year liquidity constraint. It has a lower credit guaranteed minimum crediting rate, 1% versus 3%. The current crediting rate though, is a 25 basis point premium to the existing TI traditional. It's, the crediting rate is 3.5 as opposed to 3.25. Uh, as a reminder, this is a new contract being added in November. The accumulations in your old are subject to the 3% minimum guaranteed on the top of the page. So your accumulations in TI traditional that you have today are, are unaffected. Also, both versions of TI traditional, the point at the bottom, continue to offer the ability to annuitize and convert your tr traditional balances into lifetime income. Next page, please. And uh, we also wanted to share the historical crediting rate differential between what I'll call the existing and the new traditional. So uh, the, you can see here that in every instance over the 135 and 10, the new version of TIA traditional has a higher crediting rate than the existing version. Again, your existing version will not change, it's not mappable, and all your accumulations will remain in there. We will begin to fund the new traditional in the fall of 2022. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Bruce. Appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Thanks, Jim. Next slide, please. Um, this is a, a broad description of when these changes will occur. And so we're right in the February timeframe now. Um, we encourage you, if you have any comments or questions, to uh, send those to a, an address that uh, we've noted earlier and we'll note at the end, end of this presentation um, before the end of March. Um, so we really would like to hear any comments that you would have. Um, as noted earlier, these changes will become effective November 1st, 2022. And as Jim just highlighted, if you, some of these non-mappable um, funds that he noted after November 1st, if you don't make any changes, you can make it after November 1st. So it isn't something that is, you're locked in, you got to do it by November 1st or, or you're locked in forever. So um, just as you can change funds now uh, with your investments, you'll be able to do that then. Next slide, please. Um, retirees and separated employees are considered plan participants for us. So when you hear us talk about plan participants, that's what we're referring to. Separated employees, retired employees, and active employees. So all of those people will have the same enhancement options that we've described in this presentation. Next slide, please. If you have questions, we would love it if you would send it to the email listed above, benefits at nebraska.edu, and we'd request any comments that you have about this, um, these plan enhancements by March 31st, as I indicated. Um, Brian Schlicking, looks like we have some really good questions in our Q&A section from our listeners. So do you mind maybe categorizing those or, or uh, throwing those out to the group? Yeah, I'll try to just throw these out at the group at random to our panelists here. and. Um, whoever um, would like uh, can respond here. So um, I think the first question I wrote down was uh, regarding record keeping fees. Um, record keeping fees are being transitioned to a fixed fee. How does this lower cost for employees? Um, what is the previous fees and what's the anticipated savings from this? Um, I guess I can 
nobody jumping in here, so I can go ahead and try to give this a uh, attempt to answer this. Um, yeah. We did do a competitive bid on the record keeping process and with the transition to the fixed, simple fixed record keeping fee, our overall record keeping fees for the plan are gonna be reduced by a million dollars. And that million dollars is gonna be spread over all our employees. Um, some people are paying varying levels of record keeping fees today. So other, some might not realize the same level of savings, but in totality, there's gonna be a million dollars in savings. Um, as far as the equi equitable question here, um, really to administer the plan, it, it's, it's almost a fixed cost. Um, the cost of a stamp to send out your statements is the same if you have a million dollar balance or if you have a $10,000 balance. So that is the reason behind why we're transitioning is simple to the fixed record keeping costs there is um, more to create a, actually a more equitable climate than what we have today where some are paying greater record keeping fees than others. So we feel under this new system, it'll be more um, equally spread. I don't know if any other panelists have something they'd like to add to that response. Yeah, Brian, um, sorry again about my mic. I, I tried to fix it, so I, I apologize. But but there is a table that you presented, Brian, that illustrates um, the, the source of that cost savings on record keeping. And, and basically, uh, by transitioning to fixed, uh, you know, we can we can gain access to these lower cost funds. Um, and lower or fixed record keeping plus lower investment fee means practically everyone is going to save a whole lot of money. It, and um, I mean, to that point, there are some very sophisticated questions coming through. Um, you know, one by uh, one by Mark, who, who basically sounds like he's a lot like me, where we're both invested in index funds at Fidelity, and a few people have, have pointed this out that we're we're basically paying nothing now. And yeah, to be perfectly candid, you know, uh, those of us who are paying nothing now, like we're going to pay twenty twenty nine dollars more per year um, going forward. Um, but but it is kind of a fairness issue, right? Where uh, we really haven't been paying our fair share in record keeping uh, expenses uh, historically. Um, so I, I don't know if I, I said too much or little there, Brian, but um, those are just some thoughts that came to mind. Yeah, ab absolutely. And we're not going to get all the questions addressed today, but, and if we didn't answer your question uh, to your liking, or if you have additional follow-up, um, please email the benefits at nebraska.edu and we'll get back to you there. So, um, uh, Rolling through my list here. Um, uh, here's one I think we addressed a little bit, but if we go with the brokerage window, what class of investment will we get? Um, is it as low as what we currently pay, for example, for CREF stock? Brian, you want me to take that one? Sure, go for it, Joey. Sure. You know, so the answer is it depends on uh, which fund management family you're looking at. For example, if you're in Fidelity, and you look at fidelity uh, funds, then you should be able to get the institutional share class in that situation um, versus having to pay retail. On the other hand, um, if you look at fidelity and you're looking at Vanguard or you're looking at some other fund family, um, uh, it could be an it could be a retail share class. So it just depends on the relationship that. Fidelity and their brokerage arm has with the fund family. Um, in the case of, uh, this is somewhat related, but um, you have the ability um, to set up a recurring um, purchase of these funds um, at Fidelity and TIA both. And so um, if you have 10% of your contributions going to a fund in the brokerage window, um, then uh, you can have any kind of transaction fee waived. Now, there aren't any transaction fees waived if, it's a, if you're at TIA and it's a TIA mutual fund or if you're at Fidelity and it's a Fidelity mutual fund. But sometimes uh, if you're going outside of those, there could be a transaction fee. But oftentimes, if you set up a recurring purchase, then that can be waived. Thank you. Thank you, Joey. Um, I, I think could add other... in, Brian. I just yeah, wanted to add in a caveat to that uh, in that question that the variable annuities in the presentation talked about 
the variable annuities will no longer be offered. CREF accounts will no longer be offered and they're not available in brokerage account. So we're talking about, as Joey said, mutual funds in the brokerage account. Thank you, Jim. Um, I think another common question we're getting here is how does it affect this that are older participants that are older than 65 or retired? Uh, I'll um, start ahead, that Jim. one. And it, it's predicated on what your holdings are. So if you have holdings that are not mappable, that was on that one page, whether they're in CREF or Fidelity, nothing will happen. Those accumulations will remain there. To the extent that you have monies in mutual funds that are mappable, they will map. Yeah, sure. and I would just I would just add that if you have you know an annuity uh, uh, payment already established, those will from those annuities that that will continue. It's unaffected by that. If you have a uh, recurring systematic withdrawal from um, one of the funds that's going to be mapped, one of the mutual funds that's going to be mapped uh, from TIA uh, over to the Vanguard lineup, which is at TIA, um, your um, uh, systematic withdrawal will continue. So if you've got $2,000 a month coming out of a large cap growth fund, um, that will continue. Um, if you are retired and you're getting an RMD, a required minimum distribution, um, then both TI and Fidelity will both reach out to you to confirm uh, where you want to take the funds from. So in most cases, everything will continue. As Jim said, it could be if, if you're in mutual funds, the money's gonna come from a different fund. Uh, if you're in annuities, it's not interrupted at all. Um, there'll be very explicit information that comes out on all of this um, towards the end of August, 1st of September. And um, we encourage you at that time, especially if you're retired and, and taking income, you know, to, to schedule a meeting with um, TIA or Fidelity, either one, um, to make sure you have a full understanding of how things will work going forward. Thank you. Um, here's a good one. Um, will you still be able to transfer monies among, among the non-migrated funds like we've been doing? Yeah, that's um, a, go ahead. Uh, the, those are the effect, the TIA and the CREF accounts that will be frozen. Participants can move amongst those as they always have and continue, will be able to continue to do so. I see a corollary on there, Brian, around will we be uh, downgraded to a different share class that the accumulations in those will stay in the same share class they're in. And you can, to stay again, you can move amongst those if you want. Perfect. Um, maybe next, let's talk a little bit about the TIA traditional annuity and the change there. Um, a concern was ex expressed about the 1% minimum crediting rate guarantee versus the 3% today. Um, and uh, maybe, I guess, a pushback that the changing the liquidity of going from seven years to nine years doesn't really justify the lower guarantee. Um, anybody care to comment on that question or comment? Yeah, I'm happy to take that. You know, so yes, you know, in the new, in the new uh, modernized, I think is the way Jim, Re referred to the new modern TIA traditional with the uh, in the what we call the RC contract. Um, it does have a lower guarantee, but that's by design um, because um, the TIA um, is, a, is an insurance company and, and the traditional annuity is regulated by the um, uh, state of New York Department of Insurance and TIA is required to keep a certain amount of reserves on hand, which means of all the money they collect in, they can't invest all of that. They have to earmark some of that in reserve to be able to meet that guarantee. And so when they, uh, with the new contract, because the guarantee is lower, they can actually invest more of the money um, and uh, in most cases generate the higher return. Now, if you looked at these products in the last year, um, the um, the tradition, you know, in current interest rates, short-term rates are around zero. Uh, the TIA 
traditional RC, the new one, credited at 2.75, which is just slightly below the um, current contract, which is which went down to the minimum of three. So, you know, I think TIA is well positioned, um, you know, to handle short term uh, situations like that. Um, and I think that's an example of where the um, just because the minimum was one doesn't mean that those funds will automatically go there. And then the final thing I'm going to say about that is, as Jim indicated earlier, remember all your current contributions through the end of um, October are going to stay in the current TIA that you have today, TIA traditional. Only new contributions going forward would be in the new version of TIAA that's being offered. Perfect. Thank you, Joey. Um, there's another question here. Um, I'm, I'm, again, I'm trying to pick out unique topics that, that don't overlap here. So uh, apologize. I'm not purposely trying to skip people's questions, but I'm trying to get all the topics uh, discussed so we can paint a broad picture here. But again, if we don't get your question addressed today, please follow up with us at that benefits at nebraska.edu email address. Um, uh, participant asked about revenue credits. What happens with revenue credits going forward? So, so revenue credits are built in um, to many of the investments that you have today um, in uh, actively managed uh, funds. Um, so the, the CREF annuities, TI annuities, um, and, and some of the mutual funds, and the same thing at Fidelity, um, the, some of the actively managed um, mutual funds have revenue shared. So we introduced the term expense ratio earlier. And I, just an easy example is if the expense ratio is 0.5%, then you can break that into two pieces, one part for investment and one part for administration or what we call record keeping. And, and so in order to pay for that record keeping, that's the revenue share. TIA calls it a plan servicing credit. But that money all goes into a central bucket that is used to pay the fees. And if the, if the uh, we, you know, as historically University of Nebraska has negotiated a set fee with each of these vendors, and then if the amount collected is greater than the amount negotiated, then there's a surplus. And it's my understanding that that surplus has been returned over time um, to participants. And so in essence, what we're doing is taking all the revenue credits out of the plan um, and you will be paying less for your investments if you stay with the core menu or the target date funds going forward. And so since you did, there was no revenue credit in the current and in, in the new investments, then there would be no return of revenue credits with the exception of um, the funds that are not being mapped. So if there's revenue credits being generated um, in the Fidelity 403B, then those 403B participants would uh, be available to get uh, a revenue credit from that plan. And then with the TIAA annuities, CREF annuities, there, there is revenue share there and then the people holding those annuities would have the ability to get a return of the revenue credit uh, on those funds as well. Okay, thank you, Joey. Um, getting a few questions here to our request. Um, I know this is a lot of information coming to people and it's kind of overwhelming. Um, this is really just the beginning of the, the process here. Um, the reason we're announcing this here in, in February uh, with a future implementation of November is um, we want to start the process today. So I, I know a lot of this uh, seems complex and probably seems in a different language and stuff like that. So as we progress through this project, you'll be getting more information. Um, there'll be brochures put out um, and information coming out from Fidelity to uh, assisting in this transition uh, that will provide some additional information on this as well. So this isn't just kind of like a one-time information shop for you to ask questions or anything like that. That communication process is going to be ongoing. So um, other questions about the slides for today. This presentation is going to be posted on our um, benefits. Um, 
nebraska.edu slash benefits website. So the presentation will be made available for you to, to watch uh, again. So uh, just a couple items on that housekeeping there. So Brian, if I can add something to your comment there too, that uh, many of you utilize resources with TIA and uh, Fidelity now, and those resources in terms of advisors will be available as we get closer to this period. Um, if you have specific questions on your accounts or individualized questions that you think they might be uh, able to help you with, they're gonna also be available. So in addition to the material that we put out. Good point, Bruce. Um, find some other themes here in here. A lot of questions about the brokerage window and the fee rates on the brokerage window. I think we've talked about that. Um, questions on the mapping process there and when that'll take place. And I guess maybe let's just revisit that discussion of the mapping uh, again. So uh, I don't know, Jim or Joey, if you just wanna talk about how that process will work, maybe in a little more detail. Yeah, sure. So um, <clears throat> this is Jim. Uh, the accumulations that are in mappable funds, generally speaking at TI mutual funds and 401A accounts at Fidelity will be mapped on November 1st into the age appropriate target date fund. If you have holdings that are non-mappable, which is we showed them on that page by name under the CREF, and then the, there's a, a larger basket at Fidelity, those will not be mappable. Though a participant can, we have the word manually in the participant can do that on their own volition today, tomorrow, next year, whenever they want. Um, that will always be available to them. It's just that uh, only the institution can control mutual fund mapping. Also, there's a question about um, somewhat related to mapping and, and going in and out of brokerage. That's not a, a once a year, one time thing. That's a readily accessible opportunity for you throughout the perpetuity of the program to, to move in and out of brokerage as you see fit. So Jim, as a follow up to the mapping, I, I see a question here says, will one be able to manually move the TIA non-mappable funds to anything else outside of existing TIA CREF funds? And the answer is yes. Uh, because the annuities are in what we call individual contracts, they do not allow for the employer, the plan sponsor, to direct those funds to a new investment. Only the individual can, but absolutely, um, you can take uh, the money out of TIA real estate or your CREF account and immediately move that money over to uh, a mutual fund in the core menu, or you can move it over to the brokerage account as well. The only account you cannot move immediately is TIA traditional, which uh, you have to move that in installments, and it takes nine years. Uh, my advice would be if you have money in these CREF um, annuities that you set up a meeting with TI CREF this fall during the window and, and uh, take a look at the funds that are available and, um, and uh, they can help advise you as if it makes sense. And fees are really important, but you also want to look at performance too, because there may be uh, alternative investments that are either if you go with the one-stop shop target date fund. Uh, or if you're just looking at CREF growth, for example, looking at a mutual fund, you could get in the brokerage window that um, has the same uh, asset class uh, of large growth and, and compare to see if it makes sense, you know, to move to, to, you know, a mutual fund investment versus where you are now. Some people will do that, some people won't, and it's an individual choice. Thank you. Um, I, I guess I think we've answered most of the overall themes here. I know the panelists are also looking for the questions. Is there any other questions on this list? Because there's a lot of very specific individual questions. Yeah. And I guess on those, I'd, I'd encourage you to, to email us and we can address those uh, with you on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So, so Brian. Go ahead, Excuse George. me. I see a number of questions related about what kind of information will they get in the fall. And so what you'll get is a, what we call a transition guide. And the transition guide will uh, have a chart in there. 
and it'll talk about what you know the investments that you have currently and what the replacement investment is and so um, you'll see a direct in many cases the replacement investment um, is going to be uh, well really in all cases the the replacement investment is going to be the target date funds you know so so there will be a chart that shows you there will also be a list you know, indicating uh, the CREF funds that are not uh, going away. And there will also be verbiage around the 403B accounts at Fidelity that the current balances will remain in place, but future contributions, you have to choose an investment on the new menu or the brokerage. So very detailed information will come out in the fall and uh, sent to you and you'll have plenty of opportunity to attend forums like this and ask more questions um, or meet individually with uh, knowledgeable reps from Fidelity and TIAA. Yeah, and that was actually a question here is, um, will, will there be advisors who do personal one-on-one -on -one visits uh, like Fidelity and TIAA? And yes, that, um, that will be an ongoing feature of the plan too, as well as with having T and Fidelity record keep this is both the T and Fidelity record or investment advisors will be available for your your assistance. Uh, can I intervene just real quick? This is Brian Baugh. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so there have been a few questions about these non migrated uh, assets. Uh, James Schmidt has asked a few good ones here. Uh, so basically, yeah, among the non-migrated assets, say the CREF variable annuities, you'll be able to, to move those monies back and forth across, you know, those legacy old monies. Um, and, you know, CapTrust, maybe you could help answer uh, James' specific question, which is what share class will those old monies qualify for? Uh, specifically, will they will it still be this institutional uh, class for those uh, those CREF variable annuities? Yeah, that, that is, um, they'll stay in the same share class that they're in. There won't be any change to the share class of the CREF annuities. Yeah, I, I believe they're in the R1 share class now. And uh, um, would, like Jim said, would, would stay in the same share class. Or I'm sorry, I think I misspoke. I think it's R3. It's the R3. Yeah, so. R3, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. Catch Joey. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> uh, any, oh, Brian, go ahead. I was just going to say, I mean, there's quite a few uh, questions just saying they're overwhelmed <laughs> by what's, yeah. uh, you know, what's it like. And, and you know, please don't be. Um, so, you know, just, just, I hope you're assured, you know, the point of this presentation is, is to just try to convince you all that, you know, we, we had a smart group of people, a uh, humble group of people, hopefully, right, that, you know, that, that we're trying to do best for our employees. And these are our proposed changes, and, and we welcome any feedback you might have. And as far as the specific actionable stuff for us to do, um, you know, basically, there's nothing really to do. The only thing super actionable is if down the road, you don't want to pay twice the record keeping fees, you just migrate your assets to one or the other. Um, and the, the kind of rule of thumb is if the TIA traditional product, uh, TIA traditional annuity is appealing to you, then that would probably steer you to TIA naturally. Um, I, I see quite a few questions about the brokerage window. And uh, just from, from me tinkering around with, uh, with the brokerage windows, and from what I understand, Fidelity's is going to be a little bit more robust because you have the universe of Fidelity funds. So as far as what's actionable now, you know, I, I would probably migrate assets there. But again, if you don't migrate assets, you know, because, you know, you, you don't want to, you like having diversification across record keepers, you're going to pay $30 more a year. Like it, it's not the end of the world. Um, but, but then as far as kind of the actual details on mapping of assets, like more, more details will come, you know, in the fall. And, and what we want you to know is, is that, you know, given the prudence of those targeted funds and the very low costs, most investors are going to be best served by those. And there's quite a few advanced investors who say, well, not so fast. I want to tilt my portfolio one way or the other. In which case we say, have at it. You're going to have a couple months to tweak that portfolio before, you know, and you're going to opt out of, of that transition. So, so hopefully that's what this, you know, this presentation has conveyed to you. 
hopefully we've done a good job and, and, um, and we'll save our employees a whole lot of money. So. Brian, I think that is an excellent concluding uh, remark there. So thank you for making those statements. And um, thank you to all the panelists for being with us today. Thank you to the participants for what you do for the university and uh, asking some very thoughtful questions and taking the time out of your busy schedules to learn more. Um, again, as you think about this more, digest it more, please email the benefits at nebraska.edu email account. Um, this group of panelists is generally the ones that are reviewing and answering those questions as well. So I um, want to thank you all for your time and wish you the best on the rest of your day. And um, please reach out if you have any uh, further questions or comments. So thank you. Thank you, Brian.